So I didn't get here in time to check any of the tech stuff, so you can hear me on the microphone, I assume. I can hear myself, right? Uh, hopefully the pictures will be big enough and not too big. Hopefully everything will go great. Thanks so much for coming out. Did my friend Craig make it? Craig, if you're here, wave your hand. Uh, you're not Craig. <laughs> this is why I don't carry a gun. I've never stopped using it. Not funny anymore, is it? Um, I have some things to say about that. Anyway, um, so I've been a cartoonist. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. I really appreciate you guys coming to see me. I've been a cartoonist for 30 years. I don't even believe that. 30 years. I started in 85, January of 85. And um, for, young, for you younger people, you have no idea the horror of time passing that you have to face. <laughs> Someday, very soon, it's going to be like when you're a kid, it's like birthday. Forever for Christmas to get here, and it takes forever birthday to get here. And then when you're over 30 or 40, it's like, birthday, Christmas, birthday, Christmas, birthday, Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that from him. I stole that routine from a stand up comic back in the 70s. So I figured it's safe, but then I, my guilt gets me, and I always have to out myself. I stole that routine. But still, it's funny. It's true, too. So, here's the thing about being a cartoonist um, drawing a cartoon a day is not that big a deal. It's not that hard to draw a single picture a day, right? And you think, wow, that's a great career. Well, the hard part is think of an idea a day, a joke a day, seven days a week for 30 years. I don't get time off. I don't get time off for vacation, for a holiday, or vacations and holidays are similar, um, for uh, death in the family, grief, sickness, nothing. I've got to have a cartoon every single day to send to the company. Or at least, you know, I send them ahead of time, of course, so it's not like I have to work every single day. But, but that's the hard part. So I've been doing this for 30 years. 30. Is that marker big enough to be seen? I've been doing this for 30 years. Times 365. That is well over 100 cartoons <laughs> in my life. And that is the hard part. Thinking of 100, more than 100 cartoons. It's literally been, I think, um, over 10,000. If you do the math, 30 years times 365. Anyway, yeah, it's over 10,000. I've written and published over 10,000 jokes. I impress even myself. I can't believe I've done that. I can't believe I've... If somebody had told me when I first started this, because each time I'd come up with a joke, I'd think, oh, God, is this the last joke I'm going to be able to think of? If somebody had told me I would be doing this for 30 years, I would have just shot myself. I wouldn't have even tried. I would have thought, there's no way I can do it. There's no way. I can't do it. Anyway, is this on? There's a picture. Do um, you guys want to see some slides? Yeah. All right, let's do that. This is a slide from the elementary <laughs> school. This is a slide from where my kids went to school. I don't have any connection to this slide. I just found it on the internet, but I thought it looked kind of cool. <laughs> such a dumb routine. It's such, a, such, a, such a stupid joke. And still, it often gets the biggest laugh of anything in it. <laughs> I don't even remember what's next. Oh, the opening song is next. I wrote a song specifically for you guys that I'm going to play for you now. And uh, yes, don't say woohoo until you've heard it. <laughs> uh, I'm actually not much of a singer, but I'm a pretty good guitar player, so it balances out when I get my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Get a decent cheeseburger. 
I'm going to take a, just a, take a quick uh, selfie break here, and uh, let's just uh, say, let's just, it's a picture of me with all of you, everyone. There we go. Yeah, thank goodness for cell phones. Back before there were cell phones, I used to just have to carry a mirror around with me everywhere. Like, this is what I look like here. This is what I look like in this place. This is what I look like in this place. Now I can just take a picture. What do we got next? And now we're going backwards. Oh, I see. I turned the remote upside down when I picked it up. See how that works? I can go to college. There's that. And now we can go to the next one. Our method is the safest and most foolproof in the business. We simply tattoo your face on your scalp and teach you to walk with your head down. <laughs> Think about it. Yes, there's the second wave. Keep going. This is a time release joke. I love this show. This, I love this show. This cartoon the audiences because it's it's like about 15% catch it immediately and then giggle, and then you get like about a 15, 20 seconds later you get another percent of the audience. And then at the end, there's always like that one person that finally gets explained, the person actually explains it to them, and then they laugh. See, it's kind of a difficult one, but that's what's fun. I like that about cartoons when they make you think a bit. Um, they're not as funny as Garfield cartoons, but they have their merit. They have their place, I think, somewhere in the cartoon world. Speaking of food, my mother used to puke in my mouth. <laughs> So if you don't know anything about birds, you're probably wondering why people are laughing at this. <laughs> Bird mothers chew up their food and then vomit it into their children's mouths. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that a horrible way to treat your children? <laughs> Apparently not. In bird world is considered good mothering. Anyway. When you said you ate like a bird, I didn't know I was expecting to chew your food for you. <laughs> based on the same principle. <laughs> See, food is funny. <laughs> Finish your Pepsi and Cheetos and you don't get the shirt. <laughs> this is the way families eat today. Now, I hate being one of those old guys that says back in my day, but I've gotten there now, an old guy now. When I was a kid, <laughs> it's like right. You can just like you just go on. Once you once you once you start out with when I was a kid, you can just go on forever. Okay, the world's just gone to hell, hasn't it? Ever since we were children, I think it was. I think I think the world was on its way to hell back then too. Um, anyway, when I was a kid, we had uh, we you know, we fed like a certain amount of certain kinds of. And these days, like we were not. I wasn't. Alone. We didn't have just like a refrigerator full of crap like they do now. Like we were allowed a soda pop once a week, and we would get, uh, we would have like fast food once every week or two maybe. And most of the time we ate at home and my mom just cooked dinner. It was like a very leave it to beaver kind of existence back then. And uh, some of you under a certain age don't even know what leave it to beaver existence <laughs> means. You probably think that's some kind of pornography term. <laughs> it's a new show in the 60s. Don't you wind out of the sewer? Out of the internet. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Do you want? Find the hidden history lesson, 1959 today. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, this is one of the saddest things. That, one of the most important things about vegetarianism and veganism and those things is, uh, I think, is how it relates to our environmental predicament. Um, it is it's incredibly devastating. The way the way the industrialized farming since the mid 20th century has just become incredibly devastating. But one of the worst things that we have done, which is which is very much unseen, because it's all underwater, is we've destroyed the oceans. We've we really um, we 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 fished like I don't know the estimates are like around 90 percent of the really large fish are all gone out of the ocean, and now we're all these creative fishes and restaurants that you never heard of before, they're there because those are fish that didn't taste very good. People used to throw them back.
but all the fish that so-called tasted good, you know, to most people, are gone now. So now they got to eat. Now we're eating crab fish, and we're yeah, we're depending on um, especially talented young chefs to figure out ways to make that palatable. That's what's happening in seafood restaurants. It's it's and it's very sad. And the average person in the fifties was about that size, and the average person today is about that size. And honestly, I think this is a very, this is a very direct relationship to the way we start producing food after World War II and the size of our population now and the and, and the um, condition of the environment. So. That's what that cartoon is about, in case you didn't know just by glancing at it, which you probably did, but I've got to do something up here for an hour, so I'm going to explain this. <laughs> We've been instructed to conduct a separate set of tests for Americans. <laughs> and this is actually happening. There are industries that are having to change their standards for Americans, because Americans, on average, are much larger than people in other countries. In, in London, they recently, a lot of the London theaters and the, and the fancy schmancy theater districts started, uh, took out all their seats and replaced them with fewer, larger seats because of tourists. American tourists couldn't fit into the seats. It's a little bit embarrassing. Um, but um, but it's very, but it's at the same time, it's extremely difficult. The way we produce food in this country and the kinds of, it's so much cheaper and easier to get high calorie, unnutritious food I mean, if you know, like, if you, doesn't that drive you crazy when you have to pay extra to have them leave some leave crap out of your food? Like, you have to pay extra to have to not. It's like, oh shit, boy, it would be perfect right now if I had an example of that, wouldn't it? <laughs> this, is, like, this just happened to me two days ago. I went, oh yeah, it's more if you don't want this in it. And, and I was like, this is one of those examples when you have to pay more to have less crap put in your food. But that, I can't think of. It. I'll come up with it later. Uh, here's a double thing. Patty Patty Goomba Laddie. Kids can be cruel 1965. This is when I was in elementary school, 65. And we had one fat kid in class, and, and people made fun of him. It wasn't right, but I'm just saying that's what used to happen. This is Kids Can Be Cruel 2005. Skinny, skinny, little nitty. This actually, this is like not even, this is, this, is not even, this is not even a joke. This is actually happening. Kids now are this size, and they make fun of the skinny kids. In, in class. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's just what's happening in our food system. Hey, there's a dead bird in this bucket of fried chicken. I'm suing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird, it is kind of a weird conundrum in the way I've often, I've always thought it's strange the things that we will accept to eat. It's like entirely psychological, right? Like in certain, certain countries, it's certainly okay, it's completely okay to eat this, that, and the other thing, and then to us, it's, it's revolting, right? But for real, if it's okay to eat pigs and chickens and cows, why is it not okay to eat cats and dogs? Everybody goes crazy about that. Everybody just goes nuts. Like, oh, you guys, we've got to stop these Chinese dog markets. Well, I agree, they are cruel and horrible, but have a look at the average factory farm full of pigs, which are everybody the smartest dogs. They're not our family members, but and then for instance, like it, it maybe an easier way to, to think about it is like milk, like cows milk. That's fine, sure, cows. Yeah, cows. They make milk, which is for humans. <laughs> <laughs> totally, they're, they're just magic milk making animals. But would you drink dog's milk? Would you drink horse milk? I don't know. It's kind of creepy. For that matter, would you drink human milk? That's actually way better for you. At least it's your own species. So if you could go to the store and there were buckets of human milk that was just donated by lactating mothers all over the United States, there could be any number of thousands or millions of women, women's milk in any given container. That's exactly what we do with the cattle industry. That's exactly what we do. They're just random mothers all over the country, and we're we're taking the milk from their babies and and then like that, you know. I, and I'm not trying, I'm totally not trying to be preachy. I'm really not trying to be preachy. I'm just saying. Praise. It's, it's, <laughs> yes. Uh, and I don't know what you meant, but. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to be preachy, but it's, um, it's just peculiar. Like, you, you would, you, you will go, you know, people will go and buy a bucket full of dead birds. But if there's a dead bird in there, yeah, I don't know. They're not, they're not, you know, clean and boiled and all that. But still, yeah, there's something, there's something, there. there's something there. <laughs> so unusual there. I just like the way, I don't know, I like to find the way people think. 
The government food pyramid must be working. More Americans than ever are in that period. <laughs> Yeah, the government food pyramid, you can't trust that. Maybe you will be able to someday, but you certainly can't now. Um, it's, uh, it's mostly, I, I guess, like, like the FDA, it's mostly there to protect the food industry now. It's not really about protecting the consumers anymore. I'll have number seven. I'll have a wide assortment of ingredients from your menu and different combinations than you offer them, but first, the series of probing questions. How many of you? How many of you do this in restaurants? Yes. Yes, I know it. And it's oddly enough, in my experience anyway, and I don't have any, I don't have any um, um, statistics to back this up, but in my experience, it's mostly women that want to reorganize restaurant menus. <laughs> I'm usually okay just to order whatever it is there. And maybe you say, could you leave out the, you know, just like one thing or something. But I've been to restaurants with so many women that, literally want to just like, go in the kitchen and cook yourself, that's what you want. <laughs> you can't take two things from this and four things from that, and one thing from that, and something else from that, and combine them all into some new dish that's not on the menu. You're not supposed to do that at a restaurant. Anyway, but we do it. Especially, especially, uh, the, uh, especially the vegetarian vegan types. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No heart, no brain, no courage. How do you guys stay out of politics? <laughs> <laughs> I was really proud of this joke when I first wrote it. Um, I couldn't believe that nobody had thought of it before because it really sort of just perfect. No heart, no brain, no courage. I mean, it's like heart, brain, courage. It's like it's perfect, right? Um, for, for, for what the kind of things that people complain about. Um, but nobody had done it before. I couldn't believe nobody had done it. This happens all the time with the cartoons. You come up with an idea, and then you, these days, it's, it's, it's uh, thank God for Google, but you, you go online, you mean to go online, if you come up with a joke that you think anybody could possibly have thought of, you've got to go online and look, because chances are, a lot of times they have thought of it already, and it's already been published, so then you can't do it, you can't publish it. This one had not been done yet, so I published it. But here's the problem now with the interwebs. Uh, people, change, people change the caption to how, uh, no wonder, you no heart, no brain, no courage. No wonder you're a Republican. No wonder you're a Democrat. You must like Obama. You must be a fan of book. You know, it's like, come on. It already says that. It just already says that. You don't have to make it your own dagger, you know, to prove your own point. So stop changing my cartoons. That's what I'm trying to do. You're welcome to post, by the way, you're welcome to post my cartoons on Facebook and stuff. You're welcome to do that. That's totally cool. Just don't erase all the copyrights and, and uh, signature information off of it like people do. Thinking that that somehow protects you, it doesn't protect you. It's, it's still, you know, it's still a problem. Don't be, don't be an idiot. And if you come across images like this that don't have signatures on them, they've been stolen. Try to figure out who belongs to it and get the original one with the copyright on it. Uh, and chances are they won't mind you posting it, unless you're using it for commercial reasons. That has been just a little legal break in the middle of the show. <laughs> just in case you want to, you know where I'm going from here. Ah, one more theory. <laughs> Leave it to him, come on! <laughs> Leave it to an audience of animal rights people to go, aww. <laughs> Their dinosaurs have been extinct for millions of years. This didn't happen. You don't have to feel sorry for the dinosaurs. None of this happened. It's all mythology. That's the point. That's the point. I've shown this cartoon to audiences before, and I literally have never heard anyone say, aww. Surgery. This guy actually performs brain surgery. It's 
said some of the hardest stuff in the world. And he thinks the pyramids were grain silos. Are you kidding me? That means that he basically thinks they're hollow. How do you not know that the pyramids are not hollow? It's like the weird stuff that guy says. He's also one of these guys who thinks that if everybody carried a gun, society would be safer. And, and like, well, for instance, um, I, have, I have two uh, adult daughters, and they both live in Austin, Texas, which is where University of Texas is. Huge, huge university. 30,000, 230,000, I don't know how many students they have, they have a lot. Huge university. And it's a great place, I love Austin, Texas. It is, it's just like this amazing, creative, liberal island in the middle of a, an archaic, conservative wasteland. That literally, when women were protesting about, about, about reproduction rights in the state legislature, and elected uh, state congressmen were throwing tampons at them. Literally, that's what happens in the Texas legislature. That's how archaic, uh, yeah, anyway. Austin, on the other hand, is a great place. It's a terrific university, and, 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 and the people there are very liberal and cool. And then when uh, uh, this last, it might, it might actually have been the shooting, the mass shooting here in Oregon. I mean, it's hard to say which one it was, because we literally have them twice a week now, right? I mean, that's, that's like statistically more than one time each day in the country, more than three people are killed by the same gun. And, and that's considered a mass shooting. And statistically, there have been more of those this year than there have been days in the calendar. So it's actually been more than one a day. That's, that's just insane to me. Anyway, so um, the, uh, the governor of Texas, Rick, the almighty Rick Perry, um, he decided to, uh, he, 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 he passed, uh, he just, like, passed this uh, law that uh, uh, open carry was allowed on the University of Texas campus. They're encouraging students to carry firearms, like visible firearms. Which is better than hiding them, I guess. You know, but, but see, I'm thinking, like, if you if you really think, this is what kills me about this, is think it, think it through. A crazy guy comes in here right now with a gun. Um, and he looks around, and three of you are carrying guns on your waist. Well, he's going to shoot you first. It just tells you who to shoot first. And then everybody else is, you know, everybody else is secondary because they're not armed, right? So if you're armed, you're going to be killed first by the psycho guy. But the thing that kills me, or not kills me, I should have to be careful my <laughs> The thing that amazes me is that, see, what they think is going to happen is they have this movie idea that, like, some guy comes in here with a gun, and you're going to pull a gun and <laughs> pick him up before he kills anybody, right? That's like, yeah, maybe if you're a trained CIA agent or something, but the average person is just going to, if you've got a room full of people with guns, and they hear a gun go off, they're going to pull their gun and just go like this. <laughs> while they're trying to hide, just start shooting at the noise, wherever it's coming from. That's what's going to happen. Have you ever seen a bar fight? It's not like, <laughs> you know, it's nothing like that. It's like, <laughs> and then you fall down and you're like, that's what bar fights are like. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, you've seen one. Or God forbid, bed in one. <laughs> you mostly like get the back of your head hit when you're in a bar fight because you're. Anyway, that's what's going to happen if everybody carries guns. It's going to be like this. Yeah, not particularly funny, but. <laughs> Please don't go to any trouble. <laughs> the burial. Just seal me up in one of those big, beautiful rings.
I'm actually going to get a volunteer from the audience. I'm going to have him come up on stage, and I'm going to draw a cartoon portrait of that person while blindfolded. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Now, I need a volunteer. He has Anna first, and he, and he looks he looks friendly. That's the thing. He looks like the kind of guy who's going to come up here and just be cool about it and not like try to make more jokes than I do. <laughs> what is your name? Wayne Small. That's correct. This is. <laughs> We got the first question, right? It's Dwayne. Yes. All right. Now, here's what we're going to do, Dwayne. Um, this is the blindfold. And I want you to I want you to ascertain for the audience that this is completely opaque. You can't see through it. I mean, you can always see like that little crack below it, like, but that's not. You can't see this way, right? So tell me, can you tell the audience? Can you see through that? All right. So now I'm gonna blindfold. You want me to tell you something? Do a portrait of you while blindfolded. <laughs> One thing that I'll, I'll keep talking so that you don't get bored. Um, the thing is that um, I'm gonna just because it's more interesting. I'm gonna draw you as a pirate. <laughs> yeah. So because it's just more fun. And, uh, I mean, you know, t-shirt, jeans is fine. You know, I know that's the way that, that people dress when they leave the house around here. But um, it's uh, just much more exciting to draw a pirate. I think. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you some secrets about cartooning while I'm doing this. Um, there's a, one, there's a the reason that, that cartoonists love to draw pirates is because it's sort of the only way you can get away with doing a cartoon about a disabled person. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's like you get, you know, if you have a couple old ladies at Walmart and they have a hook hand and a, and a peg leg, it's not funny. You know, it's just sad. It's just, you know, it's you're like, oh. I'm... But then if it's, a, but if it's a pirate, you're like, oh, that's, it's a pirate. That's cool. They're missing things. <laughs> that's the way pirates always, pirates always have things missing. So it's completely. Oh, and then the last thing I'm going to tell you about. Yes. That was just a, uh, a little callback to when I was a dancer. All right. The last thing I'm going to tell you is that the, um, the reason, have you ever thought about it? I don't know if you've thought about this, but the reason that pirate hats always have a skull and crossbones on them is because they're poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> if you eat one, you could die. Okay, so take your uh, blindfold off, Brian. Right. Is it Dwayne? Dwayne. Yes, and that's spelled the normal way? Probably. D-W-U-A-N-I. How does it spell it? D-W-A-Y-N-E. See? And does it look like you? It looks amazingly like right, you. Okay, so, and here's what happens now. You're going to get to keep this drawing. I'm going to sign, oh, I should have asked you, did you want me to sign it? All right, I could have signed it maybe if you had a different favorite cartoonist. So I'm happy to sign that. Maybe. Now, here's what I'm going to do. This is going to be yours. I'll take this. You stay there because we're not quite finished. Here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another portrait of you without making you look like a pirate so that you actually get to watch. Okay? So if you would just trade my hat for yours. There you go. Oh, yeah, I'll take this one. And uh, just put these on. There you go. Yeah. So now.
It occurs to me we can both be disabled. <laughs> Sorry. It occurs to me we can both save a little money if we went shoe shopping together. <laughs> trying to do it in my, trying to find my pirate accent. See, this is an example of uh, this is not that's, that's that's a joke you can only pull off with pirates. Although, here's an example of a disability cartoon that is not about pirates, unless I'm mistaken. Oh, there you go. It's the perfect stocking stuffer. <laughs> so, all right, one of my best friends has an artificial leg, and she gave me permission to do this cartoon, and she thought it was funny, so it's okay to laugh. <laughs> we West Coasters are so politically correct. I live here too now, by the way. It's not in Portland, though. I'm thinking about moving to Portland, but here's the thing. And, uh, see, you, you say that, but then I know a lot of, I, aren't, there a lot of aren't there a lot of Portlandians who hate Southern California people just like you hate people from Southern California? Oregonians in general. Oregonians in general, right? They just don't like the California thing. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm not from California, but that's where I've been living, so I'll be up moving here from California. I was actually raised in Oklahoma, Texas. But here's my problem. Who called Oklahoma? Yeah, you're from I'm, I'm from Houston. You're from Houston? I hate Houston. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Houston's lovely. Did you um uh, do you like Houston? Yeah. I did, yeah. yeah. I'm here. How'd you how did you end up here? Condition of your parole? <laughs> <laughs> Never come back to the state. I know, same with me. <laughs> That's how I ended up on the West Coast. Yeah. I'm only I'm just a little worried I'm a little bit worried about the lack of sunshine. Is that gonna kind of like do you think it's gonna sink me? I mean, would you just get used to it or are you guys are you guys all happy here because you don't care about seeing the sun? Or <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Don't know, don't know any better? Were you raised here? Washington. Washington, yeah, I guess kinda of, well west was it western Washington, coastal Washington, yeah, same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I honestly don't I didn't realize until I moved to New York City after twenty something, well, actually more like 40 years in the South, I moved to New York City, and then I realized that, you know, like as the winter, like winter by winter, I was like, I was just, you know, each year I was incrementally closer to, to some kind of a, a homicide, suicide situation, <laughs> where I just, you know, I was really like close to killing myself, it was so, it was just so oppressive, so I just wonder about it. I love Portland, but do I, am I gonna, can I, can I, can I deal with the weather, do you think? Is this a yes and no? What do you think? Okay, how many? Okay, just by show of hands, it's not to do the applauding. By show of hands, will I get used to the weather? Okay, now let's put those down. And no voting twice. By show of hands, will I not get used to the weather and I'll be so sad and depressed that I end up having to move south again? Okay. Hmm. Interesting. How far south? I don't know how far south she says. Well, just to where the sun starts shining again. <laughs> I mean, I currently live in LA, and it's sunny every day, and you know, like the weather's perfect. And I know it's nothing like that up here, but at the same time, we're in the middle of a drought. We have to import, we have to import water from the Soviet Union or something. I don't even know where water comes from in Southern California. It never rains, and it's, it's rarely cloudy. So Southern Oregon. Southern Oregon. What happens in Southern Oregon? Sunny. Is it sunny? Do, are they are they having a drought? No. no? So it's like the perfect balance, water and sun? We oh, she said no. We have shooting sometimes. Oh, you can't. Cause smog. Yeah, I know. LA's kind of got the smog thing cleaned up a bit. It's not as bad as it used to be. It used to be visible now. So if you can't see it, it probably can't hurt you, right? Isn't that kind of principle? All right, let's move on. Let's see what else we got for you. I don't even know. Let's be surprised. No meat at all? Are you sure you're getting enough protein? <laughs> yeah. That's a question that, uh, that's a question that uh, you get a lot, right? Now here's something kind of interesting. I don't know if you ever thought of this. Um, it's, I, I, I became vegan in um, 2002. Um, and the thing that I've learned since then is that everybody's always worried about protein. Um, and especially like athletic types. Okay, well, a couple things here. Number one, have you ever heard of anybody being hospitalized for lack of protein? Low protein. That doesn't exist. It's not a thing. It's like you, you, you know, you, you can you can go into the like malnutrition is a thing, but that's just lack of nutrition in general. There's no such thing as like lack of. I mean, there's there's like some kind of a medical condition of a lack of protein, but basically you only see that in people that are starving to death. 
So, no, you don't. You're not in danger of being a vegetarian or vegan will not put you in danger of not getting enough protein just to be alive and healthy. The other thing is, um, is that there's, there's any number of professional athletes that will, well, not any number, a number. <laughs> there's any number, two, two million. <laughs> anyway, no, there is a number, there are a number, there be a number of professional athletes who will, who will eat vegan while they're training because for one reason or another. So anyway, it does work. But here's what's interesting about it. The largest and strongest animals on our planet are virtually all, at least vegetarian, if not vegan. I mean, they're, they're almost all herbivores. Gorillas only, you know, the only, the only animal protein they get is the occasional dead animal they have across or bugs or something. But for the most part, the vast majority of elephants, um, giraffes, all kinds of cattle, Cattle are huge. Those little, those little orange and white cattle you see on the side of the road, those got Herefords. Not like on the side of the road, but you know, <laughs> fields. <laughs> those things are small compared. A lot of cattle are like really huge. They're like they're just this giant, strong, insanely hugely strong animals. And they're all herbivores. It's, it's kind of funny, right? That we associate size and strength with protein, but in nature, the, the largest, strongest animals are, are herbivores. Did you have a question? mentioned Houston a minute ago, uh, yeah. Arian Foster, the Houston Texans, uh, star running back for being That's a right. That's correct. Right. Did you guys in the back hear what he said? No? He was, he was asking me if I was, uh, if I was currently in a relationship and had I considered an older man. <laughs>
Say what you will about Ben Carson. He forces us to ask the tough questions like, what are they teaching people in neuro brain surgery school? <laughs> brain surgery school, sure. That's not what it's called. Uh, what are they teaching people in that school? How do you be a scientist and, and not believe in evolution? It's just a bizarre thing to me. Or at least some version of evolution. Obviously, evolution is completely, totally figured out. Yet, um, we still have no idea how it started. Uh, how life started on the planet. That's, I, I, I find that to be a really fascinating subject, how life started on the planet. Uh, but it certainly wasn't like, you know, some guy in a white sheet and a beard going, on the first day I'll make this, and on the second day, I mean, you know, that's obviously, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any creationists in the audience? If there's not, I can go, you know, are oh, you really for real? You're a creationist? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Two math for dummies at $16.99 each, that'll be $15. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is the kind of thing that I'm very susceptible to. <laughs> As I mentioned, I'm not very good at math. Somebody was going to hold up a sign for me when I was half done, and I don't even see that. I don't even know where the person is. Where is she? Oh. Five minutes. Five minutes? Oh. You're not the person who said that, 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 was gonna, that you were going to do that. But no. I, but I do appreciate it. You, you know how to tell time, you're just trying to show off the crowd. Yeah, I know when we shut down the hall downstairs. Ah, right. so I better hurry. This is what you're saying. I've only got 100 more cartoons, I'm serious. <laughs> Here's what's wrong with the human race. Hey, I'm a little different. I'm not pointing a finger here. We, we, all, we all want what's convenient and fun and delicious and wonderful. Um, and it happens to be killing us in the planet. So we gotta kind of, we gotta somehow or another, we have to figure out a way to change things, right? All right, what else? Oh, here's a fun one. This one's gonna unveil itself in pieces if my if the mechanical thing works here that I created. 21st century freak show. The blank woman. Every inch of her skin is blank, not a tattoo on her. <laughs> the geek. He'll eat anything. Trans fats, gluten, high fructose corn syrup. Good lord. <laughs>
It's the little freedoms that you take for granted in this country, I think. I do think this is an interesting psychological question. I, in fact, I have, a, I have a friend I need to ask about this because he actually is a transvestite. I haven't seen him in a while. But, but for real, like, um, I, don't, I don't completely understand the psychology of, of transvestitism. And I'm sure there's more than one angle to it. I'm sure there's like any, any number of other kinds of orientations, lifestyle orientations. You know, there's a million different ways that people come at it. But for real, like, is there, is, is, is it satisfying to dress up like a woman if you're a transvestite in a country where you have to wear a full parka with the face covered and everything? Like, if nobody can even tell it's you, is it still satisfying? It's kind of an interesting psychological question, isn't it? Anyone know the answer to this? Not personally. All right, not personally. Yeah, well, me either. All right, I'm gonna, I will ask my friend. I have a friend of mine who came out of the closet recently about what this kind of thing, and he's actually a stand-up comic. Who, who all his life has been performing as a man, and now suddenly he's performing as a woman. He just decided, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm, gonna, I'm finally gonna come out. So I'll have to ask him what he thinks about this. Anyway, I think I might be almost done here. All right, here's, here's, here's the big finale. Here's a, here's a quick quick thing. Um, another thing about how the brain works. Do you guys know this song, Bob Dylan? Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me, right? Tambourine Man, Bob Dylan? You guys know the song? If you don't know the song, then don't know it. it's fine. No, 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 he's not here. <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself, what is a tambourine man? Be a guy with a tambourine, right? If you saw a guy with a tambourine, would you ask him to play a song for you? <laughs> An experiment. <laughs> Name that tune. <laughs> Call it out. Anybody? No? 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 Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds. <laughs> Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds. You know, I recognize that. All right, let's try it on. Maybe, let's try it on. Maybe, call it out. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. You guys are no good at this at all. All right, let's try one last one, and then that's, that's I'm giving up. Anybody? Amazing. <laughs> no one ever wins that game. All right, do we have any questions and answers? If not, any questions and answers? Is there anybody? I know a lot of you have questions, but does anyone have answers? <laughs> because I'm frankly stumped. I'll turn on the mic here, and if you have questions, all right. Have yeah, and if you only have until six o'clock before you have to go, then you're three minutes late. Feed your horse or whatever, then <laughs> you can just run out and leave it. Yeah, I like that. I like that he had to walk all the way away from me to ask that. <laughs> I love you, man. I'm so glad you're here. I wish I, which I knew you were going to be here. Then for Project Books and get some autographs. I, I, I cut out every Sunday cartoon of yours, and once a year I got 52 in a book, and then I, I staple them together and I put a hardcover on them, and I archive them, and I, I save them for my relatives. And occasionally I'll, 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 I'll give you one on a piece of stationery or a postcard and mail it to friends and things. And I hope that's not. Good. So you're the reason I can't sell books. <laughs> People like you. <laughs> and and I, I just, I found your, one of your old books uh, for $3 at a yard sale. Uh, and, 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 uh, please, I'm blushing. I love the savages. Oh, yes. And, and you travel around, you know, and your fans would pick up the airport or take you to restaurants and, and uh, uh, give you a place to stay. But you never talked about food in the whole book. You never mentioned that you were a vegetarian in, in the, the book. Yeah, the book was written back in the 90s, and I was, I was not, I was just a average sheep, whatever was in front of me kind of guy back then. Yeah, that book took place, yeah, the book you're talking about is called Bizarro Among the Savages, and um, it's actually a, a book that I wrote about a book tour that I did um, in 95. Um, my, um, 
uh, I was putting out a new cartoon book and asked the publisher if I could do, you know, if they'd send me around to do a little book tour kind of thing, do some signing stuff, and they said, you know, you'd have to sell a million cartoons books at five ninety five to pay for a book tour, so no, we won't send you anywhere. So uh, kind of as a, basically as a joke, because I was kind of new to email back then in ninety five, but I was still I was one of the one of the first handful of cartoons to put their email address in their cartoon strip. Uh, I was not the first person to do it. It wasn't my idea to do it, but I saw a few other guys doing it, so I started doing it. And anyway, people had wrote to me, so I, I, I just I wrote back to everybody who had ever written me an email, which at that time was probably maybe a thousand people. But I just sent them an email saying, I want to do a book tour, but I need plane tickets and people to pick me up at the airport and let me stay at their house and drive around and feed me. <laughs> and I sort of did it as a joke. And within minutes, I had more offers than I could answer. I'm not kidding you. Within like 10 minutes, I had 60 offers from people um, that, and it was all, um, uh, nobody actually paid for it out of pocket. It was all frequent flyer miles and stuff from people who just travel a lot, you know, from the work or whatever. They have frequent flyer miles. So like, yeah, sure, we'll bring it to, I went to Miami and uh, I, was, I lived in Dallas, Texas at the time. Oh, sorry. Anyway, yeah, I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> but my question is uh, about your hidden icons and the number you put above your signature. Right. Is that an homage to or perhaps inspired by the great Al Hirschfeld or did 50 years worth of uh, New York Times Sunday newspaper arts and leisure front page cartoons of Broadway and shows that he did hide his daughter's name, Nina? somewhere in the cross hatching the writing a number of his name and how many Ninas there were in that particular cartoon and, and uh, is that where you got the idea? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll continue to answer your question, but yes, have a seat. We're not waste any more of my time. Um, no, it's a great question, thank you very much. And thanks for being such a big fan unless you're lying, but if you're not, that's very flattering. Um, until you said that thing about the yard sale. Um, but yeah, Hirschfeld, of course, I'm a big fan of Hirschfeld. Um, I started hiding little images in my cartoons, um, actually because I was, as a kid, I was such a big fan of Highlights Magazine, and they had those puzzles in there where they had all the hidden stuff, and their lists of hidden stuff, and I just thought that was, always thought that was great. And it was a lot of fun for me as a kid, so I started putting little upside down birds and things in my cartoons. And then people started responding to them, liking them, and wanting to know what they meant. So I invented some meanings for them, which are all very deep and philosophical, and they're on thezara.com. If you want to go to my website. Uh, by the way, I noticed, that some people, I noticed that some people are sneaking out early. Shh, don't turn around. Okay, everybody turn around. Um, thanks so much for coming, guys. Drive safely. They're going straight to in and out Burger, you know it. Well, they don't have those up here, do they? Anyway, um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, as soon as this is over, I'm going to be. Uh, I, I brought a whole bunch of color prints of some of the cartoons you've seen here and some of my other favorite cartoons, and they're only 10 bucks, and I will sign them. And please buy them because they're heavy. I really want to drag them back home. So I will sign them uh, to you.